This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. So my name is Amanda Giles, and uh, the name of my talk is The Way to Theme Enlightenment. If you like to follow along with the slides, I've just tweeted them on my Twitter account, which is Amanda Giles NH, or if you visit AmandaGiles.com slash enlightenment, it will take you there. Um, I encourage you, even if you don't want to follow along now, which is totally fine, I'm going to try to cover a lot of material, and I put a lot of links in my slides. So if you're interested in some of the things that I cover, I would encourage you to go and get the slides so you can follow the links. What I'm going to try to give you is the uh, everything I wish I had been taught about, about theme development that I had to kind of learn the hard way. I'm not going to go in-depth to a lot of things, and I'm going to kind of start from the first things I should think you should know into the later things. So hopefully there's probably a spectrum of people here and some of you are going to be like, oh, I do that, I do that, I do that. My goal is eventually I get to something that you're not doing that maybe you'd like to know more about. So you won't be an expert by the end of tonight, but hopefully you will have some more tools to go look up. So just a little bit about me, or at least about me in a professional context. Um, I've been programming since 85. I got, I was just the right age where we had computers in the school and they were easy to program. So I wrote my first programs in BASIC and Logo. I made my first website when I was in college in 1994. I was really into Magic the Gathering, so it said Mistress of Magic. I was also into the Beatles, so it had a bit about John Lennon. And I had this section on my website called Rants, which we would, of course, now know as a blog. But <laughs> um, I've been an independent consultant since 2006. Before that, I worked for other companies. I always had a really hard time with that. Um, and I discovered WordPress in 2009. I had a uh, brother-in-law who was really into it, and he actually helped me a lot. And I had one of those classic, I had a small project, and that person knew somebody who had a big project. So it was very much trial by fire. But since then, it's taken over more and more of my life. I started the Seacoast New Hampshire WordPress meetup in 2011, which Tom referenced. We meet up in Portsmouth, and we actually have two meetups a month, one that's geared towards users and one towards developers. So if you live somewhere between here and Portsmouth, I'd encourage you to just get on our list. And if we're covering a topic that you're interested in, we'll uh, try to make it worth your while. And I also recently in the past year became part of a web development agency called Spark Development, and we focus exclusively on WordPress development. So if you're anything like me, pretty much I think this is everybody. When you start WordPress development, no matter how much of an expert you are in using WordPress or as a programmer, pretty much we all start like this because learning to program in WordPress is not just about knowing PHP, knowing HTML, CSS, JavaScript. It's really about understanding the WordPress system and learning to work within it and work efficiently and elegantly within it. So we all start here. And what I want to tell you is that's OK. <laughs> that's perfectly OK. In fact, if you, there's a great quote from the um, Zen monk and Buddhist Shunru Suzuki that says, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. But in the experts, there are few. And to me, this just says that there, as a beginner, you're going to look at everything. You're not going to do it the same old way you've been doing it. You are open to the possibilities. And in WordPress, that's, that's a lot of what I would encourage you to do, is look at the possibilities. And don't take that as a bad thing. There's always going to be more to learn. And this is a good thing. So very first thing, if you're going to be Creating themes, oftentimes we start with modifying an existing theme, and the right way to do this is with a child theme. Even if you think, I'm not going to change a lot, just a little CSS maybe, um, I just encourage you to get in the habit of creating a child theme right off the bat. What a child theme does is it's an additional theme that you install on your site, and it basically sits on top of your parent theme. You have a parent theme that's the one you want to change. You build a child theme, which is a very bare bones structure, and you put all your customizations in there, and what WordPress does, what, what building the child theme does is it separates your changes from the parent theme. And what happens then is when your parent theme gets an update because there's a security hole or maybe they add a new feature, you can upgrade that parent theme without losing your customizations. Um, so just in the same way that you've probably heard people say, don't modify WordPress core files, you really don't want to be modifying WordPress theme files too unless it's a theme that you wrote. And the way that WordPress deals with it is WordPress, if you have a child theme installed, it's always going to look in the child theme first for whatever template file it's looking for. So 
If it knows that it's looking for a single post template and you've customized that, it's going to look at yours in the child theme. If it can't find it, it's going to go to the parent theme. It's just going to move along. So it, only your customizations have to sit in there. And it's actually incredibly easy to build a ch child theme. You literally make a new folder in your WP Content Themes folder, and you create a style.css with a very specific header. And the most important thing here is this template tag at the bottom. And the template tag contains the folder name for that parent theme. And that's what tells WordPress, hey, if you don't find it here, this is the other place to look. Typically, you're also going to have a functions.php. And one of the things that you want to do in there is bring in your parent theme styles. This can vary a little bit, but um, we're going to go a little more into this later. But all you need to know about it right now is that this says, hey, load my parent theme styles, and then load mine afterwards, so that all my customizations come after. All my overriding of the parent theme will happen later. Template hierarchy. This is only the second thing I list here, but it's honestly one of the biggest things when you start in, in WordPress theme development, and it's something you will always reference, should always be aware of. And what the template hierarchy is, is how WordPress determines which template in your theme it's going to use. It's got two pieces to the name. Template is because every file in your theme is essentially a template. It can be used for multiple pieces of content. It's a structure. It provides the structure for your content. And it's called a hierarchy because WordPress looks at it as a hierarchy. WordPress will look in a certain order for files. And you don't need to have 50 files in your theme, but you can. I've actually seen themes that just had one file, index.php, well, and the style.css. Um, I don't really recommend that structure. WordPress has a great structure to help you, but um, it's important to understand it so that you're editing the right file and also so that you're not repeating yourself. If you have a very similar style in your theme and you don't quite understand the hierarchy, you might end up putting the same code in multiple files unnecessarily. Um, so this is what it looks like. Obviously, you can't really read it from here. That's fine. Um, I'm going to zoom in on a little piece of it for you just because I think it's so important. So this is a little piece of the logic about how it would find the correct category page for you. So WordPress, the, um, the black bits on here are the, just the page type. They're not page files. And basically, we're going to work from left to right. And the way that WordPress is going to um, look is it's going to look for the most specific template file it can find to the least specific. So at the very beginning, it's going to look for, if we're looking for a category page, it's going to look for a category, dash, and then the name of your slug. So let's say we had a news category. WordPress will look in your theme and say, hey, is there a category dash news file? And if there's not, it's like, okay, well, the next thing is category dash ID. So if my news category is, is uh, ID 5, it's going to look for category dash 5. So you would really only use that if you had very specific templating for the news category. You didn't want to look like any other post category. Beyond that, the next file it's going to look for is category.php. If it finds category.php, it'll stop there. It'll use that as the display. You don't even have to have a category.php there. You can have an archive.php, which is one level beyond that. And WordPress will uh, look there. And finally, there's actually kind of a little fork here, which Honestly, in every theme I've ever built, I've never used this. But if you want to have a separate template for the subsequent pages of your theme, you can add another file called page.php. And if WordPress hasn't found anything here, it's going to go to index.php. When you look at the template hierarchy, you'll see all roads lead to index.php. But most of the time, you're going to have something more specific, a more specific template before that that you're going to end up using. So just a quick hit on some useful theme functions. Get header, get sidebar, get footer. You see them all in your theme files. The part that you may not know about them is that you can also pass in a string. And if you pass in a string, it changes which file it's looking for. So when you call get header in your theme, it pulls in header.php. But if you call get header with news as a string, it's going to look for header-news and bring that in instead. Same thing with sidebar and footer. I use it most with sidebars. It can be a great way to differentiate um, different sections of the site, defined with different sidebar areas. Get template part is a great way for you to essentially not repeat, use your code. Get template part has um, two parameters that it accepts. The first parameter is essentially the default file name, and the second parameter 
is an extra bit. And what get template part does is it takes both pieces of that, and if you pass it, say, content dash, if you pass it content and then news, it'll look for a content dash news file. But if it doesn't find that, it's going to look for just a content.php file. So it can be a way, I used, used it a lot with like post types where you might be um, looking for basically a more specific version of the content and if not, you're going to default. And it's a great way to make sure if in your site you've added new types of content that um, you're always going to be covered. You're always going to have a file it's going to default back to um, whether it's more specific or less specific. And then get blog info is just a nice general function. It covers, it has a whole bunch of things you can pull basically from your settings pages. So you can pull the name of your blog, you can pull your tagline, your description of your blog, you can pull um, a whole number of things. It's just a, a very useful all around function. Um, WordPress has conditional tags in it. I'm not sure how I feel about the word tags, but that's what they call them. So if you're searching for them, that's what we don't call them. They're basically a bunch of Boolean functions and they tell you things about what page you're on, um, what, uh, what, I'm sorry, what type of content you're looking at, what type of page. So some a common examples that I end up using are is front page, um, which tells you if you are on a, a page that's the front of your blog, not a post, not a page with your post, but an actual page. Is admin is gonna tell you if you're in the admin area. Is single is if you're on a, a single, piece of content, so a single page or a single post versus an archive page or a taxonomy page, some other kind of archive. Is page um, is one that you can call in a number of ways. So you can see is page just by itself. Clearly it's going to tell you if it's a page, but you can also pass in a page ID or a page name. So this again just allows you to, rather than creating a whole new template, allows you to call a little bit of a function, do something a little bit different if you only have a minor variation. Is page template is a way for you to check if you're on a specific custom page template. Again, usually I'm using it to do some kind of conditional display. Is category works like page, so that's gonna tell me if I'm on a, a category archive page. And again, I can pass, I can just say, hey, I'm on a category period or am I on a specific category? Uh, same with is post type archive, we'll talk about those in a little bit and is tax is a taxonomy page. So again, just helpful things to know. There's a slew more of them, but if you're thinking, gosh, how do I know if I'm th on this type of content? Chances are there's a conditional tag for it. Your content functions. This is mostly, you see these in your loop. These are functions that work only when you're in your loop and they work on the current uh, content that you're showing. So they happen on archive pages, but they also happen on single pages. And there's always, there's always a matched set. So the ones on the left, you can see all start with the, the title, the permalink, the date, the post thumbnail, the excerpt, the content. These functions that start this way, they all immediately um, echo or print out the content to your page. The ones on the right look very similar, but you see they all start with get, get the. These functions will return the content to you to look at in code. You might still spit it out, but they give you a chance to maybe do something different based on whether content was returned. So for instance, with the post thumbnail, oftentimes I'll check, hey, is there a post thumbnail? And before I build a wrapping HTML element to display this, this image, I'm gonna check, hey, is there, is there even a thumbnail? Because if I don't check, I might spit out this container for the image that has 40 pixels of padding on the bottom, and then I have this like, extra long padding, so they're just, it's helpful to understand the difference and understand that you can use either one. And the one tricky one I'll mention is the content. If you do get the content, one of the things that doesn't happen is WordPress doesn't do its normal magic on it. And one of the biggest things it doesn't do is it doesn't process any short codes in your content. So if you're going to get the content and then you're going to be putting it on the screen, 99 times out of 100, you wanna look up this little snippet of code you can look it up, I look it up all the time. <laughs> Copy and paste it. And we'll talk a little more about what this means later, apply filters, but essentially, you're going and doing the logic that WordPress already does. And you just wanna make sure you do that because otherwise all of the magic things that WordPress does when you use like an embed short code or a column short code, they aren't gonna happen. You're gonna have this code with these brackets and weird words and your client or your, your friend or whoever you're building a website for yourself are gonna be like, what in the world is that? Functions.php, this is 
one of the other files that you will almost always have. Anytime you look up an article on WordPress, you'll see a lot. They say, oh, put this snippet in your functions.php. This is a file that if you just create it in your theme, you don't have to do anything other special to include it. WordPress will always look for that file, and it will always read everything that's in it. And if you make a change to this file, and then your screen goes white, go and undo whatever you just did. Take it out, comment it out. Um, you can take your whole entire site, the admin, and everything down, because everything in that page is loaded all the time, front end and back end of your site. So be careful. Um, but within this file, you can write your own functions, and you can also access WordPress's core or plugin functions through the use of hooks. And when you're writing function names, make them unique. Don't, don't <laughs> when, you, when you find a, like an article online with something you should stick in there, look at the name of the function it's going to give you and put a little prepend with the name of your theme or something that's going to be more specific. Because the other problem is that every plugin that you have loaded on your site also has a number of functions. And if they have the same function that's called you know, uh, get image, <laughs> chances are you're going to have a conflict. And when you have two of the functions, then again, you're going to blow up your site. So, what am I doing on time? Does anyone know what time it is? 8.06. 8 Talk fast. Okay, this is really ambitious. I want to show you so many things. Um, CSS classes. So, uh, most of us use CSS a lot to modify WordPress themes. It's honestly the simplest, easiest way you can modify a WordPress theme. And the two functions that make this super possible are a function called body class and um, another function called post class. So here, body class, what this does is, this is a function that you put by default into your theme. Most themes have this. Um, you actually just pass it by itself. You don't put class around it or anything. And what WordPress does is spits out a whole bunch of classes automatically for you that say things about what kind of content you have. So in this case, you can see um, these bottom examples are examples of uh, classes that WordPress would stick would put in for you automatically. So things like page, page ID, page template name. If you want a category page, you'd get uh, archive, category, category news, category one. Now these classes on their own don't do anything, but they give you a way to target uh, your content and styling. So let's say you want to have different colors on your site for different categories. You don't need to create different templates. Just make sure you have a body class tag in there, and then you can just put in some CSS that says, hey, body.category news, make all my headers green. Um, and you don't even need to be creating template files. So it's just important to understand there's some things that you can do really easily with this class, with this function. Same thing with post class. This is typically used in your loop for each piece of content. So on a single page, you're going to see it once, but on an archive page, you're going to see it once for each article that you're, a uh, piece of content that you're using. And similar, oops, sorry. Nope, wrong, wrong, wrong way. Wow, oh, I clicked a lot more, sorry. So uh, post class, same kind of thing. It's gonna do, it's gonna give you a bunch of classes. It's gonna give you a class about the type. It's post, type post, status. If you're using post formats, it's got format in there and it's also got a category. This can be really helpful, especially in search results. If you wanna display, differently content based on what kind of content it is. The loop. We could do a whole class on this. You've all seen it though. You all probably feel like you know the loop. Um, this is a very basic loop. If have posts, while have posts, the post. The post is the piece of magic that makes all of those the title, the content, the post thumbnail work. And then in here we're using that get template part function that I talked about. And we are looking in a folder called template-parts for a file called content.php, but before that, content-postformat. Super easy, just bear with me if you haven't used the loop much. Um, really what I want you to know is that if you want to get more advanced with the loop, if you want to write your own templates, you want to have um, more advanced querying going, that it, it used to be a few years ago if I had something really complicated, I would actually end up writing a SQL query because I was comfortable with SQL and like that was how I'd get the data I want. But the loop, uh, WQ query, I should say specifically, has come a really long way. And really quick, the way that WP query works is you create an array of values that WordPress is going to use, WP query is going to use then to write your SQL query for you. So in its very simplest here, 
I'm saying, okay, I want to pull post type book. So I've got a special content area on my site called book. I want to pull 20 of them versus the usual 10 or whatever my blog is set at. And I'm going to order them by title and ascending. If I didn't put title in there, it would order by date descending. You know, same as everything else. But, and then the next thing I do with that is I take that array and I pass it to WP Query. And then I basically do the same kind of loop except I use this variable, in this case, dollar sign query, and I prepend all of my um, normal loop functions with that um, on the outside. So query have posts, query uh, have posts, and query the post. Now once I get to that post part, then everything else is normal. I'm still just using the title, the content, all of that. But at the bottom, very important, I want to call WP reset post data. And what that tells WordPress is, hey, go back to the normal content that I was pulling because I just stopped to pull something on my own. Um, it's very important to do it so that the rest of your site content, when it's processed, remembers, oh, right, I'm on this kind of page. I'm not on a book. I'm on whatever page I was on. So the two things that you can use to extend the loop that are really powerful are tax underscore query and meta underscore query. And in these examples, which because I don't want to keep you guys all night, I'm going to pass through. But basically, you can do some very advanced things where you can query under multiple conditions and combine them. So in this case, I'm looking for a book, and I'm saying, oh, I want the genre to be romance, and I want it, the genre to be featured. Normally, if you say, hey, give me featured and romance, you're going to get stuff that's in one or the other. So this is a way to say, hey, um, I want it to meet both criteria independently. In this example with the meta query, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to use a field that I have called rating, and I'm going to say my rating is greater than or equal to three, and I'm also going to say my uh, recommended flag is equal to Y, except in this case, I'm saying or. So I'm actually saying one or the other. I want to get my highly rated books or my recommended books. It's not something you, can, you get with a standard query. It's really powerful if you understand how to build your own queries. So go to the WP Query page if you want to build a query. You can build it. It's, it, it's very powerful. Editable regions. So when you're building a theme, my experience really is building themes for clients. And there's actually a, a philosophy in WordPress called decisions, not options. And I honestly think for client development, it's I don't follow it. I, for me, for my clients, I like to give them a lot of options. Anything, basically any area of the site that they might want to edit or that should be, uh, I want any area of the site that they might possibly change or that they could want to change, I want to expose that to them. Not in a really complicated way, but pretty much I'm not going to hard code the name of their site into the theme, and I'm not going to hard code their logo. I'm going to try everything I can to make it make their site customizable for them. This may not be right for you and your client, but from my experience, that's what's very helpful. So uh, this is just my own term for it, is editable regions. And the two biggest examples of that are menus and widget areas. So, to me, a good theme creates editable regions versus hard coding versus making assumptions about what the client likes. And they work actually very similarly. So with menus, you, a user can create as many menus as, you want, as they want, but what you do in the theme is you create a menu area. You use this function called register nav menu or register nav menus to do multiple. And what you do is create a location that they assign a menu to. And so they can create as many menus as they want, but they pick the one they want in the moment. You know, maybe they're doing some A-B testing. You know, day one, we're going to run this menu and see how many people make it where they should. And day two, we're going to run this. It doesn't really matter why. You create the location, they can create the menu, and they assign it to that location, and they can change it whenever they want. And you just know, hey, I'm going I'm to display this menu. So registered nav menu creates that location. And then these two functions down here, when you want to display that menu in your theme templates, you have has nav menu, which is, again, a conditional tag. It's going to check if you have a menu assigned. And if you do, then you can use WP nav menu, pass the name of that menu location you created, and display it. So these register nav menus are something that are typically in your functions.php file. And then these other has nav menu or WP nav menu, they're probably something that's in your header or your footer file, but could be in a regular theme template as well. Sidebars and widgets, this is exactly the same logic, just different names. You're going to register a sidebar area. So when you go in that appearance widget section, you see all of those sidebars. Those are all created by your theme. That's why every time when you change themes, you're like, 
oh my god, where are my menus? Where are my sidebars? It's because every theme, they're custom. So you can create these within your theme, and you can create them anywhere you want people to be able to edit content. So if they want, you know, three columns in the footer, and they're like, this is exactly what we're going to have in the footer, that's great. But if you create three footer widget areas, then you can um, leave them a space to put whatever content they want. Even better, maybe you have an options page where you say, how many footer columns would you like? And then you create that many areas. So a register sidebar, register sidebars. Again, this is something that would be in your functions PHP file, most likely. And then you're in your sidebar.php file or your header or your footer, you would be using something like is active sidebar, which says, hey, is there anything in my sidebar area? And dynamic sidebar to display it. Hooks. Hooks are one of the most powerful things in WordPress. They're amazing. I wish somebody had told me about them early on. A hook is a way, is an event within WordPress which allows for additional code to be run when it occurs. So what this means is, and WordPress has tons of hooks built in. When WordPress gets to a hook, it's like a shout out. It's like, hey, I'm in the header. Does anybody want anything? And if you have a function hooked in, WordPress will run your function. So you didn't have to hack into WordPress core. You didn't have to write your own plugin, or you can write your own plugin and use them as well. Um, a hook allows you to um, you know, tap WordPress on the shoulder or tap a plugin on the shoulder and say, hey, I'd like this to happen too. So you can have as many functions as you want associated with a hook, and they'll all run whenever that hook is triggered, and you can even specify what order they run in. So if you're having a conflict with something else running earlier or later than yours, you can actually affect the order. So hooks are basically, the short of it is that hooks are the responsible way to edit the code. You don't want to edit WordPress core files. You don't really want to be editing somebody's plugin because you won't get all of their great updates without losing yours. Hooks are placed within WordPress core plugins and even themes to allow customization by developers without directly editing the code. And like I said, they're the proper way to do things. So the two main types of hooks are action hooks and filter hooks. And action hooks are like, hey, I just want something to happen right now. And filter hooks are, hey, pass me that data you're working with. I might want to make some changes to it. Or I just want to look at it. I want to do something, and I might change it, and I'm going to pass it back to you. So those are the two types of hooks. Action hooks that are most common are in, thing, in, oops, in theme development are things. Ah, swear the. Okay. <laughs> are the um, in theme development are things like init, um, before main query is one, pre get posts. This is an amazing hook that lets you alter the query that's running for a page. So rather than getting to a page and doing a WP query like I talked about before, if you know beforehand you just want to like change what content's already there, pre-get post lets you do it beforehand instead of having to run another query. WP head, WP footer, those are ones you've all seen in theme development. Those are just like, hey, what do you want to happen here? You want to enqueue a script? You want to, I mean, print out a script or something? You want to print out some code? Whatever you want. It's up to you. Filter hooks allow you to alter the data, like I said. So a hook, a filter hook is going to actually pass you a piece of information, which you can look at, and you can pass back as it is, or you can not pass back anything. And if you forget to pass that back, then that's actually a common mistake sometimes people make with filter functions, is they get the data and they look at something, and they forget to pass it back. And if you don't pass it back, it thinks you purposely passed back something empty. So. Action hook example, so for instance, WP head. Function WP head, literally all WP head does, this is a function in WordPress core, it literally just says, hey, do action WP underscore head. So any function that you have associated with this tag, WP underscore head, WordPress is gonna run it. So this is what WordPress core has up here, and then in your code down here, you have this um, function called add underscore action, and add action is go you're going to pass two things. One is, um, at a minimum, two things. You're going to pass the tag, the, the hook name that you want to associate with. And then the second thing you're going to pass is your function name. So th obviously, this function needs to live in your theme. Otherwise, it's not going to find it or, or your plugin. Filter hook example, also very similar. This is an abbreviated version of the content function that we talked about, which is in WordPress core. 
And one of the things it does is it gets the content, and then it says, oh, apply filters at the content. So this is that thing I was telling you before, like, hey, you want to make sure to do this? But the other cool thing about it is you can write your own filters for the content. You can, you can write a filter that says, everywhere I have the word Trump on my site, I'm going to replace it with Drumpf, just because. And you can just write that. You just do a search and replace, pass that piece of content back, and, and feel better if you're not a, a Trump fan or if you just like Drumpf better. So... Um, so this is a similar pair of functions, but not the, exactly the same words. So apply filters is what WordPress or your plugin is going to, um, that's how it says, hey, do you have a filter you need run? And add filter is how you say, yeah, I have a filter I need to run. In queuing. In queuing is a system that WordPress has for bringing in scripts and styles into your WordPress theme. And it's basically a way of like, politely putting your stuff in line rather than just shoving it in. And the beauty of putting it in line is that there are a lot of things that you might use in your uh, theme that maybe your plugins are using too. And the most obvious example is jQuery. So pretty much every theme and every function out there uses jQuery. And if we didn't have in queuing, you would probably have five different copies of jQuery on your site and they would conflict with one another and not behave well. So in queuing is a way to tell WordPress hey, I have this thing I'd like included. You know, when you get to that part, will you please include this file for me? And it can be very helpful because if your plugins and themes are doing it properly, you can also dequeue stuff. You can say, hey, you know what? That, that version isn't working for me. Or you have a theme that gets installed and it comes with three sliders and it runs all that JavaScript, even if you're not using any of them. You can go into your theme, find out what it's in queuing and be like, all right, I'm going to dequeue that as well. So you can both in queue stuff, put it in the line, you can also dequeue stuff and take it out. Um, so it prevents conflicts, it can help improve site performance because you're not loading more scripts. And you can even declare dependencies. So this is the example that we looked at earlier where we were in queuing when we created our child theme and I said, you want to in queue your parent styles. This is what I was talking about. So here we actually have like a whole array of things we've talked about already. So we have our add action, which is our way of saying, we're going to use an action hook. We got something we want to do. The hook name is WP and Q scripts, and my function name is theme and Q styles. Not a very original name, but you only have one theme, hopefully. So, um, And then in the actual function, theme and Q styles, I am using this function called WP and Q style to in queue my parent style. I'm giving it a name here, a hook name, not a hook name, but a, a, a handle called parent style. And then I'm using a function to get my theme directory and saying style.css. Then below it, I'm doing the same thing with a second style sheet. But this one, I'm giving a handle of child style. I'm doing the same thing. I'm getting the name. Um, actually, one of these functions should be a little bit different. There's a different function, template directory URI and get style sheet directory URI. One of them points to your parent theme and one to your child theme. So I will have to fix that. But then I'm also passing a little extra piece of information. I'm passing an array here and I'm passing the handle parent style. And what I'm doing there is I'm creating a dependency and I'm saying, make sure you load this other file first because I want my changes to come afterward. I want to override all the things in the parent theme I don't like. Using WordPress as a CMS. This is a whole other topic we could do. I'm going to say very quickly, WordPress comes with some post types, posts, pages, revisions, menus, media items. But WordPress gives you the power to create custom post types. And even if you're not familiar with this, we've all installed plugins that have done this. So for instance, things like events, portfolio items. A lot of themes come with portfolio items. That's a custom post type. Products, WooCommerce creates a post type called products. Resources, forms. If you've ever used Gravity Forms, it's creating a forms post type. So these are all ways to extend WordPress. They're really powerful. Taxonomy, same thing. So taxonomies that WordPress comes with are categories and tags, but WordPress can be extended to create new taxonomies. So event categories, maybe a portfolio medium, um, maybe a team. Maybe you have a team members and you're putting what team people are on. Anything you can think of, that's the point. And when you use these, you get to use all of that infrastructure that WordPress already uses for posts and pages. So it's just very powerful, and it's very important to think about up front when you're thinking about how you're going to structure your theme and what kind of content you need. 
Custom fields are kind of are the third piece of this, and custom fields are a way to track more specific information that's going to be specific to a particular item. So for instance, for an event, you would use a custom field for the event date. You're not going to create a taxonomy for event date because otherwise you'd have to have you know, <laughs> taxonomy for like every day of the year. So these are custom fields are for very specific pieces of data. A price, a location, a position, anything that's not going to be broadly applied, that's going to be specific to one piece of content. So extending the WordPress structure, we basically marry these three types and we create a very powerful content management system, or CMS. Some of the tools that you can do this way, you can do all of these things by yourself, but there are also some plugins to do it, so if you're not really much of a coder, in which case I'm sorry because your eyes are probably glazing over by now, but um, there are some functions where you can do this, you don't have to know how to code this. Custom post types and taxonomy plugins, a lot of these go hand in hand. These three plugins that I've listed here, which are all linked on the slides, um, will let you create both of those. You can also, um, advanced meta and custom fields plugins that are popular are advanced custom fields, custom field suite, CMB2, and Metabox. These function, these plugins are really great because they give you a lot of power, particularly the um, advanced custom fields and those other plugins. They let you create a lot of different types of fields where it's not plain text. You can create a color picker. You can create a date picker. You can, you know, have a whole WYSIWYG editor. So. You can extend WordPress yourself. You can write all of these functions yourself. Um, there's also a great site called generatewp.com, and it actually has a whole little GUI where you can say, hey, I want to create a post, post type called book, and you put in all of the fields, and it writes the code snippet for you, and then you can take that and put it, it writes the function, and it writes the hook, and you can put it right into your functions.php file. How are we doing on time? I'm going to skip short codes. Short codes are something really cool that you can write. You can check the slide. They basically allow you to put a little piece of code, and WordPress goes and turns it into something else. But the best part is it's actually super easy to write your own short codes. Right. So if I was a time lord, these are all the other things that I would talk about for you. Uh, the transient. So if you've sat here bored and you're like, I know that, I know that, this is maybe your page. So if I had more time and I could go back, I would also talk about the transients API, the customizer. I would talk about customizing the admin, creating dashboard widgets, uh, debugging, and developer tools in general. So um, these are all links to different things, so please just go check them out. Um, and my suggestion too is just up your game if you're doing theme development. Um, read developer blogs, find ones you like, find developers you like, or you hear speak at a WordCamp and follow them on Twitter or subscribe to their blog. Um, the WIP newsletter, of course the day after I put this in here, uh, for WordCamp Maine, the WIP announced that they're only going to do a weekly newsletter now, but they used to do a daily. Um, but it's a great newsletter. You can sign up for free. Um, subscribe to updates on Make WordPress Core. This makes, gives a lot of emails, but Helen Sandy recommended it, and honestly, it's great knowing what's coming down the pike. So I will warn you, there's a lot of email that you get from it that I end up deleting, but a lot of it is super interesting. Um, Post Status is a paid service, but Brian Krosgaard, who does it, um, curate some great content, podcasts, other things. And I just encourage you to set aside some time each week to read WordPress news, research code, um, use an IDE, an integrated development environment, because it will let you do things like right-click on a function and go to the source. So if you want to know what that WordPress function does, if you have an IDE and you have your whole WordPress core, you can really easily um, uncover things and see what's going on. Some resources, some more links, the codex, the theme handbook, the code reference in general at WordPress, also great ways to learn what you're doing. The biggest thing I hope you take away from this, as horrible, horrible as it sounds maybe, is the more you know, the more you know you, know you don't know from Aristotle. And it's true, the more you had crest a, a hill of theme development and there'll be more things, but there's just... Um, that's also just more goodness, more power that you can learn, in, incorporate into your themes, and that's a good thing. Another smart guy said, once you stop learning, you start dying, and I really do believe in that. Apparently even Michelangelo said it, but the last note I want to leave you with is this is actually not true. Might as well have been this guy. Um, so my last warning to you is if you are looking on the internet and you find a code snippet for a WordPress theme function you want to do, look at that date. And if it's more than like two years old, 
Like, just look around. There's a lot of things that change. The WordPress core environment is changing all the time. And if you use the same code snippet that you found three years ago, the chances are there's a, there's a function built into core now that does that. Um, or there's perhaps a better, healthier, elegant, more elegant way to do it. So um, that's my message for you. And also, Steve Jobs, bring it in the jobs. Um, stay hungry, stay foolish, and keep learning. Thank you very much. And uh, I think the, the meetup is ending, so if people need to leave, that's okay, but I'm happy to hang out and answer some more questions. So. Yeah. Um, well, learning what? Learning theme development or learning PHP? Yeah, I don't know if, um, I don't know if Code Academy has a WordPress section at all. Um, I honestly hunt around. You know, when I want to do something, I will kind of Google it, look at it, different things, developer blogs, uh, take it with a grain of salt. You know, some, I don't, I don't know that I have a specific site to recommend on that, sorry. Um, WP Beginner is good for some stuff, but oftentimes they recommend plugins too. But sometimes they have little code snippets. Um, the theme handbook is actually really good. The codex is really good, honestly. I love the codex. I got his great stuff in it, so. You had a question? Um, yeah, so in a lot of themes, or, or maybe it's in WordPress core now, but you have the option to override some CSS in the theme. Yep. Do you know of anything, or is there anything in the pipeline you know of that would allow you to, uh, to not have to create a child theme, but to override minor things in some of the other files? Well, if it's just CSS, some well, non -CSS, oh, non-CSS. Oh, non-CSS. Uh, you can do the CSS. I'm just wondering if... Yeah. Because sometimes a child theme, it has disadvantages to, um, you know, the auto-updaters, for example. You want to update your parent theme, but it won't work. You, I mean, you can run the normal updates. What do you, what do you mean? There's certain... Um, I mean, the so whole... Like, I, I get themes from uh, themeforest.net frequently, and, uh, you know, there's a plugin for themeforest that'll check for new updates and automatically update it when you have one. Yeah. Um, that will, when you have a child theme, if it's not, if the parent theme is one of those, your child theme is active theme, like the plugins don't work. So really? It doesn't, it won't update your? Yeah. Oh. So there are like little disadvantages or nuances. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's a way, if you get rid of child themes, just do like <laughs> CSS overrides. I mean, if you're just going to do CSS overrides, certainly some themes just have an option right in there, so you don't have to write any, yeah. any file. Jetpack has a module custom CSS that will also add it. Um, as far as the theme structure, like if you're really going to change functions and stuff like that, I don't, I don't really have a lot of advice on that. Okay. okay. Not in the public. Right. I know. I mean, I have to say, one of the things that's frustrating for me is uh, Genesis themes. Their whole structure is that Genesis is your parent theme. And then the theme that you buy is the child theme. And that drives me crazy because I have to edit their child theme. And I guess they must not update them a lot, but I'm, I'm always like, I feel kind of dirty when I do it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't want to update this. <laughs> okay. I, I'm happy to hang out. So if you have a less public question or you feel like you need to go, thank you very much. <laughs>